Good evening. Um, before we start our last lecture of this semester, I have two, three news. One is a sad news that today's lecture is the last one. In this semester? This semester. But good news that we will continue in September. And uh, the third news is that actually you will get an extra lecture on the 6th of June when uh, Gaze Christiansen is coming. <coughs> and uh, you are very welcome as well to visit our auditorium in June. Well, but, um, and another thing actually. So I would like to thank this year curators, Silla, Bihlak, and Johan Daly. Um, it has been a great year. There was a 14 brilliant lectures. Um, and please join me to applaud, a big applause. Um, it's my pleasure to and, and honor to introduce today's speaker, Quillem Jan. Uh, Quillem is an architect and the co-founder and CCO of Fologram, a Melbourne-based uh, design research practice and technology startup building uh, platform, which explores uh, how building directly from mixed reality environments can extend the skills and capabilities of designers and builders by improving spatial understanding of design intent and reducing the risk of human error associated with exploring 2D instructions to 3D form. They build tools that dramatically improve the ability of conventional craftsmen and construction teams of, to fabricate structures with a significant variability in parts, form, structure, texture, pattern, and so on. And in many cases, completely reverse design viability as impossi impossibly expensive and difficult proposals become straightforward, low risk, and cheap. Uh, William holds an academic position as a lecturer in architecture at RMIT, where he developed design research in the fields of mixed reality environments autonomous robotic fabrication, behavioral design systems, and creative applications of machine learning. His work has been published in leading computational design conferences and journals, including IAC Acadia and RoboAC, and he has given talks, presentations, and workshops as well at international institution, institutions, including um, MIT, Stuttgart ICD, UCL, AA, SIAC, and Tsinghua University. Uh, very important thing. We will see one object in reality. Uh, Skulem is one of the authors of Tallinn Architecture Biennale Tab 2019, where he and his team won the installation competition. Uh, uh, the winning proposal name was Steampunk and installation will be built in August in front of the Museum of Architecture of Estonia. So please join me welcoming Quillem Jan. Uh, th thank you very much for having me, Ron, and for Silla for inviting me. Um, Forgive me if I fall asleep at the, the lectern. It's been a long time since I've been able to have a sleep, but I'm, I'm excited enough, I think, to be sharing this work with you today. It hopefully gets me through the next hour or so. Um, what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, I'll try to spend about 45 minutes or so um, uh, giving a little bit of context and background to the work that we've been doing at Fologram over the past year, um, work that started at RMIT and, and was for the most part collaborative with other um, practitioners based in Melbourne. Uh, and then walk you through some of the projects that we've been doing um, uh, with the software that kind of emerged from a particular set of research interests that were developed at RMIT 
Um, and these projects are also increasingly collaborative. They're projects, um, I'll, I will talk about the, the design for the um, Tallinn Architecture Biennale, which was a very collaborative project. Um, but in, they're also projects which are, are collaborations with industry because what we're really trying to do and, and why I've temporarily left academia is um, find better ways of, of building things. And we think that working or making in mixed reality is, is one way um, that we can do that. Uh, after the talk, I've brought along a, um, a, a toy um, with me. It's a HoloLens headset. I'll give you a quick demo, um, show you how our tools work, and then if you have time and if you're interested, you're welcome to come down the front and I can jack you into the matrix and you can try it out for yourself if you haven't tried one before. Okay, so some, some context, as I promised before. So um, we write algorithms and taught ourselves to code to expand the, um, the design space of our thinking, if you like. So we treat um, computational tools in much the same way as many architects treat pencils. Um, they're tools for exploring particular ideas, um, tools for broadening the ways that we can think about design. We spend a lot of time um, not trying to uh, make existing design processes um, computerized, if you like, so automating things, making them faster, more efficient, but instead trying to think through architectural problems in a computational way. So trying to describe the problems of architecture, you know, um, th these might include things like how you distribute program, how particular parts of a building might begin to blend and merge, how you articulate differences between the scale of a, a form at its facade and the scale of inhabitable spaces, um, how you begin to introduce vari variation into the surface of something to make it perform better structurally. All of these things become encoded as algorithms um, and, and behaviors that are simulated and that begin to generate architecture for us. And the job of the architect becomes one of the sort of the judge or the, the, the critic um, who can determine which kind of outputs um, the computer is creating are better than, than others. Now the issue with working in this way is we can create incredibly complex sensational form. And th this is a project not by myself, it's by my um, business partner, Cam. But when you show this to um, uh, anyone in the construction industry, the, the, the response is that it can't be built. It's beyond the limits of what um, we're currently capable of, of certainly efficiently producing. And rather than just treating this as being a paper architecture project and leaving it as it stands, we spend far more of our time as, as designers and researchers trying to incrementally shift what is possible to build, just step by step, um, adding to our capabilities uh, than we do in, in producing design proposals. So we do things like um, building small scale machines for prototyping 3D printing at larger scale. Uh, we try to teach um, machines to see and to respond to the environments that they work in so that we can reduce part failure and um, explore these kinds of generative processes through material rather than having to simulate everything all the time. Uh, we speculate on how fabricating in particular ways can begin to generate characteristics and effects of architecture which are um, extremely complex and a product of allowing material to be sort of fuzzy and messy and variable and inconsistent and different. Um, rather than trying to, in a very modernist way, impose form on material, and always returning to finding ways um, to build these designs. So this project was um, a project for a meeting room at RMIT. It was an internal competition. They're the best kinds of competitions because you usually know the jury and um, it's uh, reasonably easy to politic your way into the short list of people who who um, are almost selected, but in the end that we didn't win this competition because the jury decided it was unbuildable and they were, they were perfectly right. But they did say, um, or, or I asked them to, if they thought it was unbuildable, um, at least give me some research funding to begin to prove that some of it could be built and they agreed to that, which I think was a pretty good consolation prize. And so we started making machines um, and specifically making dies for plastic extruders so that we could, rather than 3D printing um, parts of buildings, which you see a lot at the moment, everybody's trying to print um, 
in a very predictable, consistent way parts of buildings right now. We're interested in instead um, extruding tube and coming up with ways of controlling the amount of air pressure that was in the tube to create these kinds of inflated plastic bubbles that were a characteristic of that pro proposal I showed you before. So here we're, we're literally dragging a slider in, in Grasshopper, changing a parameter in a digital model, and the material is um, in real time responding to that shift in the digital model. So we're able to generate all sorts of characters, qualities, effects that are kind of a product of both having a lot of digital like control over how material is, is, is extruded over time, and also having not very much control at all, allowing the material to, to form in very complex ways. Um, we've done other work with robots, and this will I'll come back to this later, and you'll, you'll see why it's important for working with the HoloLens. Um, this is a collaboration with Roland Snooks, and um, we wanted to try and teach two robots to form material um, uh, together. So to work in maybe a, an analogous way to how you might bend parts of um, steel by hand. You know, one part would hold, one hand would hold the piece of steel, another hand would bend it. Um, with an interest in then scaling these processes up um, beyond what you could physically do by hand. So here, two robots are bending a whole lot of steel rods, um, which then become the parts of a of a pavilion. Um, which I, I'm, I don't think I'm going to show you. They can do that incredibly efficiently and quite accurately. And so I think there's about you know, 300 parts in this pavilion and the robots bend all of those parts in a day. And they bend them and then they drop them in a pile like this. And what you don't normally see with these really high-tech projects, you know, that's a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of um, industrial robotic arms. There's a few PhDs working on various control systems and things to make sure that project happens. It's in a really expensive laboratory. And then you have these color-coded drawings. You have all of the parts laid out by some students in a corridor somewhere, um, sticky taping things together temporarily, and then cable tying things together, and then gradually assembling things by hand and by eye um, with a lot of kind of human intuition because it's very, very difficult to train robots to put these complex parts together. They just they'd hit one another, they'd hit the parts, um, and take a long time to program. So the robots could fabricate these parts in, um, in under a day, and then it took 12 students five days working just about around the clock to put it together. So the problem that we face at the moment, if we're trying to incrementally shift what um, the construction industry is capable of building, is not a problem of making complex parts. So we can already 3D print very, very complex parts very, very cheaply. Um, it's a problem of assembling those parts together, and it's a problem of making human labour um, much, much, much more capable of doing non-standard things. So this is where, and this is not like a problem that's unique to the construction industry by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's unique to kind of all manufacturing. And this is the, I love showing this slide because, oh, ignore, um, <laughs> ignore our slack. Um, because this, this is a slide from a paper published by two engineers at Boeing in 1992, and this is where the, the term augmented reality was first, um, first used. And it was used to describe a system for helping a, a manufacturer of an aircraft wing really, really precisely locate things like drill holes or wiring paths in space so that they could do their, their job more efficiently. So with this system that um, these two engineers imagined and then actually built back in 1992, they weren't trying to take the, the engineer out of his physical workspace and put him into some virtual environment and then show him how to build a building. He was still seeing all of his workspace as completely familiar to him, and you would just have one tiny little bit of digital information that was added to help him perform, or her, perform some, some task, in this case, showing where a drill hole goes. And this is the advantage of augmented reality really over a lot of other ways of making complex things. So you get precise registration of digital content to physical space. So you can place any digital model in any physical space and it'll stay there in the same spot. You can easily create the jargon in the industry as shared experiences, but it's basically um, many people can see the same thing at the same time and all interact with it, which makes 
you know, complex fabrication tasks possible because generally speaking, you have multiple people working on a construction task at any one time. And it's reasonably natural and intuitive to interact with the models that you see. So we're getting close to the point now where you can see a virtual object and pick it up and manipulate it as if it was a physical object. You don't have to learn how to use Revit or Rhino or you know, even a mouse or a touch screen or any of these user interfaces. It behaves as if it's there. Um, augmented reality headsets, they aren't necessarily new. The HoloLens is, is um, particularly exciting for, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. But since the 60s, Ivan Sutherland's been, um, people like Ivan Sutherland have been building headsets that can display digital content in physical space. It's not a new technology. Similarly, the idea of using augmented reality to assist with construction, um, architects have been excited about this for a long time, and this is an example from fairly recently, from about a year ago, a couple of students building an augmented reality system to assist with bricklaying. What we've seen over and over and over again, though, in the research community is that everybody who is working with augmented reality for construction is working with completely custom hardware and software. Um, so in this case, these students, or students and, um, and probably faculty, have built a custom headset, a custom computer vision system, custom markers, and then they've written custom software to put all of that stuff together. And it makes it really, really hard for this research to translate to industry applications, to take this onto a construction site, put that headset on a bricklayer, get the bricklayer to start building a building. There's just too many pieces which can go wrong. So the big advantage of the HoloLens is that Microsoft, um, through about $6 billion of this problem of standardization of augmented reality hardware, and came up with what is a self-contained computer. Um, so it's a Windows computer. You can write software for it like you would any other um, Windows machine. Um, and this headset's able to figure out where it is in the room without you having to set up any external sensors. So you can put it on. Um, usually, you've got to click at least one button. And then you'll see some digital information and away you go. So it's super duper easy to use. The only catch with the HoloLens is that Microsoft made some really good hardware, but then assumed that the only people who would be wanting to use this hardware would be game developers. So they thought it was going to be a gaming platform. Um, and as such, you needed to be able to write code to use it for anything at all. So all we've done is made it so that the people who actually have the exciting uses for things like the HoloLens, for augmented reality, um, and those people, by the way, are people like you. They're creatives, artists, makers, designers, engineers, people who actually work in physical space, work with their hands, create things. We made it so that those people can use devices like this more easily by building um, augmented reality apps um, in CAD software that they already use. There's a really basic kind of technical model that, that um, we've implemented to make this work. So you have some geometry from your CAD environment that gets sent to the headset so you can see it. And then gestures and sensor data from the headset, which is how you interact with those models, gets sent back to your CAD environment so that you can then change the geometry you see on the headset. This lets you do all sorts of stuff. So for instance, I'm going to race through this super quickly. We've done. Um, Bricklaying from augmented reality models. We've taken digital models and turned them into kind of virtual clay that you can pinch and stretch and pull in Rhino. Uh, you can use it to assemble sort of large structures of repeating parts, but repeating parts with unique joints. Roland has taken these things on site to assist with kind of fit out where as built conditions don't necessarily match digital models and for doing things like installing really large scale steel frames. We're super interested in adding digital precision to low-tech analog tools, things like pottery wheels and lathes, and doing the opposite, where you begin to control very high-tech, precise tools with more natural human gestures. We love the idea of augmenting traditional craft skills, like basketry. Most people are using AR for things like this, just visualizing designs on site before they're built. But you can use it for things like interacting with structural simulations and fabricating things, where rather than using drawings, you have a 3D model of whatever it is that you're trying to create, and you use that as a template to go and build from. So that's the, the background. Um, now we'll jump into some projects. And the most legible, I think, um, 
application of augmented reality is to bricklaying. And it's because bricklaying, for projects like this, they, they're sort of, they take a long time, um, they're very, very expensive, and they're very, very high risk to build. Because, in this case, every single brick in the building had a unique drawing and a unique structural detail. Um, a little bracket with a custom bolt um, in order to install it. And the bricklayers who ended up taking on the job found that super stressful because it completely changed the way that they normally work from brick. So it's a standard medium, but a completely non-standard construction process. And to give you a sense of the experience of the bricklayers, um, this project was on Australian national TV, and I've just got a little short clip to show you. With a degree of difficulty, torments some of the best bricklayers in the trade. Take him out, get a little bit of mud, and do it again, yeah? Yeah. It's stressful. Some days are better, but most of the time, it's stressful. When it's finished in August, it will have cost around $180 million, partly because it's very hard to build. Each of the 380,000 bricks in the building is bolted to a steel frame. There's no margin for error. The position of every brick is checked and rechecked. It makes for slow work. I know a brick lay like four, five, six hundred bricks a day, but this job here, 70, 80, and a straighter wall, maybe 100, 120. And the beginning was embarrassing, you know, brick layer, that was only lay like hundred bricks, but this is the way the job is. That guy's so rich now, by the way. Um, he did very, very well out of that project. Um, but there's a few things there which are interesting. One, it's much slower. Um, B, the bricklayers just don't enjoy it. C, it's, it's stressful. Um, D, you can see the guy struggling with his spirit level, trying to level up the, the, the bricks, but none of the bricks are, you know, on a curving brick wall, it's impossible. And so we were wondering whether or not um, we could begin to create similar kinds of, um, I guess, variations in, in masonry structures um, without going through this sort of arduous documentation process of needing to draw where every single brick goes. So the first thing that we tried doing, this is about you know, a year and a half ago now, was just creating a, an interactive holographic model where you could step through courses of bricks by clicking on one of two buttons. So you'd put the Hollands on, you'd see the first course of bricks, um, wherever you saw a holographic brick, you could place a physical brick until the hologram and the physical brick overlapped. And once you'd finished a course of bricks, you'd click on one of these buttons and it'd show you the next course of bricks. Um, the advantage of working from the hologram is you only have to place the hologram in the right physical location once, and then all of the locations of all the subsequent bricks are always right. So you never have to measure anything. Um, you never have to check a drawing. You never have to go back to a laptop. Um, you just have to place it once and then you've got all the interactivity you need. So we did a few of these foam brick structures. Um, this is one that we did uh, as part of a really short workshop in Germany. It was a, a two-day workshop and we built this in half a day. And it's two and a half thousand foam bricks so that are glued together. So we're not working with, with proper masonry processes and proper brick laying in this case because there's no mortar and mortar really adds a lot of complexity to the process. But we are trying to explore this kind of quality of very, very gradual change in the, um, in the patterns and distributions of all the bricks. And this is just really to test whether or not the HoloLens and, and our approach was sort of robust enough to, to um, match the architectural intent. So as I was explaining before, you have this little hologram, a couple of buttons. You can see a kind of a, a holographic footprint of where every brick goes. You just place the foam brick inside of that footprint um, just by eye lining it up. And that's an incredibly fast, efficient process. You can do it very, very quickly, which is how we did two and a half thousand in, um, in half a day. And so just to prove that it's, it's, um, I'm not lying, uh, these are a couple of quick clips. I mean, if you look closely, there, there are a few things, like there's this split line in the middle of the structure. Um, and that was just because we were building on an uneven floor, so we did get some accumulative error in, um, in these parts, but generally speaking, there was sort of very, very minimal error locally. Um, so each one of these bricks was, was in kind of the right spot. 
So we did enough of these, these foam tests to be confident, confident enough to try and persuade a bricklayer to take on a job. Um, we found one down in Tasmania, which is sort of, um, uh, the joke is that it, Tasmania is kind of like the prison island for Australia, and Australia is already a big prison island. And um, th one of the, these bricklayers wanted to take on a job. This is him. There isn't a single brick on there that lines up to anything. Every brick is different. This would take like two weeks. Yeah. Fine guy, and a lot of that would have to be so this is Colin talking about his project. Um, he used exactly the same holographic model as we used for the, the foam bricks. So you have these two buttons, you're stepping three courses of bricks. Um, the hologram is placed in the right spot on site once. So that's all the bricks, right? So see how you are here? That one's good. This one here, Shows it's got to come around. So just treat that like like you do your streamline all the way around. Hit that back. And th this was kind of a joyous moment for us in a way because not only was um, uh, like Colin had three bricklayers working on this project at once, and one of them was an apprentice. So he'd hardly done any any bricklaying before. This is one of his first jobs, but he was able to jump straight onto a really complex job because there was a completely unambiguous representation of what it was that all three bricklayers were trying to achieve. And that's sort of what you're trying to learn as an apprentice over the years. So we could skip that, basically accelerate the training of this, this apprentice by just allowing them both to see the same thing. And he reckons every song that he made, he used to think, he used to get scared, but fuck. Excuse me, sir. I'm <laughs> <laughs> He's very Australian, I apologise for that. We, there's um, a version of that video that's beeped out. But. So he was nervous that he couldn't make anything better. Um, and uh, what actually happened after this project? So the bricklayers on the, the, um, the Gary project in Sydney, they were doing 50 to 70 a day, and that's partly because they had to attach every brick to that steel frame. Uh, these guys were doing this at 300 a day, and so their normal rate's about 500 a day. Um, to do the set out on this project, Colin reckoned it would have taken close to two weeks. They got that down to half a day. So this is sort of basically 10 times faster than what they would be able to achieve without the technology. Uh, we started doing some scans of these structures as well. So um, this one is... Um, we did a LiDAR scan of the project. It's a little bit hard to see, but um, I mean, if you watch it closely, essentially bricks are all in the right spot. Um, we've started applying it to much, much, much larger projects. This is a prototype for a bench for a hospital, and there's about 100 times as many bricks as this in the hospital. They're now using uh, Fologram and the, the HoloLens on the actual construction site um, rather than working from existing technology. So they were confident enough after doing that first brick wall and then this small structure here to just roll it out on site, which we're a little bit terrified by, but they're um, super excited. So bricklaying is like a very, very clear, simple application for augmented reality. Um, but we're really interested in how it might impact all, all sorts of making, really. Um, my partner in Melbourne, she's a jewellery designer. Um, she's been exploring... Well, basically, I've been encouraging her to explore, but <laughs> she's been exploring using um, AR for sort of assisting with folded, folding these steel structures and then painting enamel patterns onto them. Uh, we've done a lot of work with creating kind of complex wireframe structures from steel where you have some stock material, um, completely custom joints, and all you're doing is trying to match a hologram of the wireframe with some welded steel stock always trying to scale this stuff up, so trying to get closer actually to uh, rebar scale for doing uh, concrete reinforcing. Um, just you know, playing around in, in workshops with, with tools and adding augmented reality um, templates to things. And I mentioned before, I mean, I'm kind of interested in how this impacts um, design viability and design feasibility. So this, this is a sketch for a chair. It took about 20 minutes to model because 
everything intersects in this model, um, or if things don't intersect, they maybe don't perfectly join where they're supposed to. Uh, nothing is flat. Nothing is rationalized. It's, it's a sketch. It's the back of the napkin kind of sketch. And if you wanted to get this thing built, in order to describe it to a fabricator, you would need to go through all of those rationalization steps. You would have to, because the, the fabricator is not going to be able to build this by panning around on an iPad. It's too difficult to understand this 3D object on a 2D screen. They're not going to be able to build it from drawings. It's too difficult to project, um, especially without, you know, with intersections and without all of the, the joints resolved. And so as a result, you just wouldn't even try and make this thing, I don't think. Um, it's too inefficient, not viable. What we did is we just whacked it on the HoloLens, used it as a guide, and then while you're building the model, like these two images, they're not um, exactly the same. That's kind of deliberate. And that's because the digital model's not buildable. You have to change it in, to some, some extent. But what it lets you do is, as a fabricator, you can make intuitive decisions about how to deliver design intent rather than just imitating what, what is drawn. Um, and this is really exciting to me because it means that, again, something that would be extremely time consuming, costly and difficult to build can be done in half a day. So this is just as fast to fabricate as fabricating something from sheet and right angles. For this reason, oh, we don't need that crap music. For this reason, a lot of art fabricators are starting to use our tools because with art fabrication, you don't necessarily need to work to construction tolerances of, of five millimeters. You just need to deliver on an artist's design intent. And so they get excited by just being able to essentially have a fabricator and an artist in the same experience looking at the same model, um, being able to agree on what is going to be produced before it's built. Um, a few more examples of, of artists working with things just quickly. Uh, this is Jeff Farquhar Still from Canberra. Um, he designs these sort of very fluid, flowing, curvilinear geometries, which are really hard to describe with drawings. Um, he's been working with augmented reality to do the modeling and the fabrication of these structures, making these kind of ever more complex things. Um, people like Jules Retson have been using um, augmented reality to um, promote designs to clients, but also to assist with assembling these kinds of structures, especially the steel substructure within these things. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we've been um, partnering with uh, like DIY self-build companies like U-Build that need to find more efficient ways of, of describing um, to lay people how to assemble um, uh, sets of se sort of quite similar components together um, while meeting things like engineering standards. Um, and so these things are kind of scaling up. But we're, we're also, I mean, up until now, all these projects I've shown, they're just about taking your digital model, which you've already got in Rhino or, or on your computer, and viewing it in mixed reality in order to then realize it. There's not really a feedback loop there. You're not taking something from the real world and putting it back into your digital model in some way or another to affect it. There's no, there's no, um, no feedback loops. But it's pretty interesting um, developing new ways of interacting with digital models using natural user interfaces. So we've been exploring a little bit how you might begin to model in physical space. So things like drawing 3D splines um, in physical space is actually a lot more intuitive than drawing them on screen because you have depth perception. So you can understand all three dimensions of what you're drawing at once rather than only understanding two. And you can start really rethinking um, what design tools can be used for. So I don't think anybody's ever made a darts game in, in Grasshopper or in Rhino because it, just, it wouldn't be that fun to play on a screen. But you can use those tools to build those kinds of, um, uh, well, we'll just call them experiences or apps. So Grasshopper is perfectly good at modeling you know, things like vectors, moving things around, um, pretty quick to build a tool and you know, it took me a little while to get the bullseye. Um, Cam's not too impressed there. But what's, what's exciting about this for me is um, a lot of the design tools we use, they were, they were kind of extensions of the drawing board, if you like. And um, more recently, there's, there's been a few extensions of those. There's some very, there's algorithms which are easy to reproduce and as a result, you see a lot of them. We have certain tropes and cliches in, our, in the digital design community. 
and finding ways of kind of breaking out of the box of, of what our, our tools can easily produce and starting to think about them in radically new ways um, is, can only be good for design, I think. The other thing that is exciting about augmented reality um, is the possibility of collaborative modeling, like truly collaborative modeling. So again, with Rhino, um, if you're working from a computer, you can only have one person modeling in Rhino at once. Um, of course, you can collaborate, but you export your model and you send it to somebody and then they change it and they send it back to you. It's not really real time. But with, um, in AR, you can have as many of these headsets or phones or whatever it is connect to your Rhino model at the same time. All of them can be making changes to that Rhino model at the same time. And so you can create these kind of participatory experiences um, without even needing to know Rhino. So you might have a stakeholder or a client um, start you know, modeling or massing studies or moving things around in a design um, together with an architect, which is kind of exciting. We can do things like simulate stuff in physical space. Um, this is interesting from the standpoint of wanting to be able to match the behavior of digital simulations to the behavior of physical material. So let's say you're designing something as a cable net. Um, you really want to see what that cable net's going to look like in situ after it's built. Um, you could start doing things like prototyping smaller cable nets, um, aligning the hologram of that cable net with the physical object, and then tweaking all of the parameters of your digital model until those two things overlap and perform in exactly the same way, and then you scale it up. So this was a, a little test that we did in a lecture theatre in London, modelling just by pulling points around in the theatre, sort of 30 metre span of um, these cable, virtual cable net structures. Um, AR is also a way of bridging the gap between um, people and robots, so being able to intuitively control where robots move um, is something which is actually pretty difficult to do if you've ever had any experience working with robots. So being able to see a virtual um, robot in the same space as a physical robot and anticipate what it's going to do before it does it is, is pretty powerful. The other thing that we're super interested in, and we've only done a little bit of work like this, is um, trying to like quite directly extend what people are capable of doing. So we thought, well, maybe we could we could build an AR app that would just turn everyone into Michelangelo. It'd, you know, it'd make you a brilliant sculptor without you having to go through the 20 years of training, 10,000 hours. Um, and we thought we could do that by basically tracking where a physical tool was in space. So we put a marker on it that we could detect. Um, and so as you moved the physical tool around, you would have a digital representation of that tool in Rhino. And then we'd change the color of your holographic model based on how close the virtual hologram was to your physical carving tool. So it'd sort of go red as you got to where it was supposed to be. We, it turned out we couldn't carve the horse at all. It didn't turn you into Michelangelo by any stretch of the imagination. but um, we were able to build a whole lot of sort of iterations of this idea. So rather than showing the whole model all at once, you know, showing a horse and then saying, kind of go for it, you can, you have a bit of feedback as to whether or not you're too close to that, that horse model or not. We began modeling things that were themselves the product of many Boolean operations, many cuts, and then showing those cuts one at a time so you could really carefully concentrate on the cutting task. Um, just like those Boeing engineers carefully showing you know, where one drill hole would go at a time rather than showing the entire aircraft wing. So distilling the, the information down into sort of singular tasks meant that, I mean, this is a little three hour exercise in a workshop. We were able to get kind of close. I mean, it's nothing amazing, but um, it's, it's sort of a, I think there's a lot of promise to these kinds of processes where you, you provide feedback to somebody on, um, on the tasks they're performing. Okay, two more quick projects, and then I'll jump into a demo. One of them is, um, I mean, we've done a lot of work with bent steel. So because, similarly to brick, um, uh, bending steel with the, from augmented reality um, instructions, it it's kind of lends itself well to AR because um, it's one of these things which is very, very difficult to do without having either a very, very expensive CNC process or two robotic arms, like I showed you at the start of the video, or just having a lot of skill. So 
we sort of took this design. It's a little bit like the chair I showed you before. Um, a whole lot of very, very complex interwoven parts. The difference between this and the chair is, in this case, we did try and resolve all of the joints in the structure. So everything in this design is actually very carefully modelled to be in exactly the position it's supposed to be. We were trying to produce this as faithfully as we could. Every part in the structure is, um, is unique. It has, they all have sort of completely arbitrary bend angles. It's about 100 pieces. And we wanted to explore how we could go end to end design to fabrication to assembly to post build analysis all in augmented reality and see kind of how accurate the process would be. So we're building this in China um, at Tsinghua University and this was our construction site. It was shared with a whole lot of other workshops, a whole lot of students, there's just junk everywhere. Uh, we were building something quite large and we wanted to verify that the structure that we were building would actually fit into the gallery or up this ramp um, to be welded together at some point. And how we did that was just walk around with the HoloLens. So the HoloLens, as I mentioned before, it's able to tell where it is in space without you having to set up any external sensors. And it does that with a bunch of onboard cameras. And as a byproduct of that, it's always building a sort of 3D representation of the space that it's in. So to create a point cloud representation of our site, all we had to do is walk around the site and we'd get this for free. We were able to model the thing so that it was sort of 90% of the way to being buildable, but we couldn't get it 100% of the way. Um, and so we had to make some pretty manual changes before we started construction. And rather than doing those on screen, I just walked around inside of the model um, and sort of made a little revision bubble tool so I could trace, trace my hand to, you know, in this case, suggest oh, we need to add a joint here, or maybe we need to thin out parts of the structure, or maybe there's a few bits that are colliding. And at the same time, Cam was sitting on a laptop in Rhino, seeing me virtually walk around, making these revision bubbles, and then changing the, the digital model um, in parallel, basically, which was pretty efficient. So once we got the model right, uh, the next step was to try and build it. So we couldn't really rely on, um, uh, I mean, we didn't really want to rely on anything being provided for us in this workshop. We wanted to ensure we could deliver it even if we were just doing it in the middle of the desert with nothing. So we brought a steel bender um, to China in our backpack. And then much like the bricks, we overlay a hologram over the steel bender. We've got a couple of buttons um, uh, that whoever's wearing the HoloLens can see. And using those buttons, you can display one bend at a time, um, whatever part you want to fabricate. So that looks like this from the point of view of the person doing the bending. So you slide your bit of pipe into this really, really crappy bender. Um, the bender was so was, it was really difficult to use because not only would it bend your part um, as you swung it around like this, it also slightly twist the part. So if you were trying to fabricate these pieces um, just using a 2D sort of diagram showing you the right bend angle, you'd never get them even remotely accurate because of the error of the twist. So to compensate for that, we showed a sort of a sweep. So as you're bending the part around, you can always see the, the shape that it should be and you can accommodate for the twist while you're doing it, at least once you develop a bit of skill with the tool. So to do a bend, this is um, Ching lining it up. Once it lines up at the end, you know it's right. Just like with the bricks, once you, it overlaps, um, physical and hologram overlap, it's correct. So normally you'd have something like this, tons and tons of parts laid out on the floor. You'd have a big spaghetti mess in your Rhino model. Your construction site looks like this. It's all looking like the robot project um, earlier on in the, in the chat, in the talk, um, which just makes it incredibly difficult to assemble normally. So we instead, as always, had a holographic model which would show us part by part um, at least where the part was supposed to go in a structure. So it wasn't really showing any more than that. It wasn't doing any path planning. We left it up to the sort of intuition of the fabricator to decide things like this, like how you would thread a part through the structure in order to put it in the right spot. The, the kinds of things that are really hard to digitally model or anticipate um, or describe. So this is um, 
what Tong's seeing in the model. So you can iterate through, choose all the different parts. And um, once you've chosen the right part, there's a bit of sort of muscle work clamping it all together. So we built the thing. Um, and we knew how accurate it was, because you can see the hologram of the structure, and you can see the physical thing, and you can see where they don't perfectly match up. But we talk about it all the time, and so we needed a way of communicating just how right it was, or measuring how right it was, if you like. We didn't have any fancy scanners or anything like that um, in this workshop. All we had was the HoloLens. And so we thought, well, maybe we could just redraw the structure um, sort of piece by piece using, again, this, this tracker, the same tracker that we put on the, the hot knife um, to try and do the carving. So once you sort of redraw each, each piece in the hologram, the hologram and the physical model match perfectly. So you end up with a, a perfect representation um, as a digital model um, of what has been built. And then you can compare what the digital model was initially before you built it and the digital model of the as-built thing measure the difference, and that gives you the error. So that's what we started with. Uh, red is where there's some error, and then that's the digitized model. And that's the photo of it. So in this case, unlike the chair, we were trying to get it as close as possible. Um, so this was built with a very cheap bender, um, which twisted parts as well as bent them, with students that had never done bending before over the course of a day. Um, at worst, it was 42 millimetres wrong, and the average was about 16 millimetres wrong. So it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. The, the brick laying, by the way, is much more accurate than that. Um, but we think given all of the constraints, it's, it's you know, relatively good. So we've done bigger ones of these. So the problem with this is they photograph really badly. So it's really hard to take a photograph of, um, of these sort of bent steel things. It's, exactly the same problem as on the laptop screen. It's a 2D representation of an innately 3D form. We need to create some surface, and so we had the, what we thought at the time was the genius idea of um, just doing the same thing, but with timber. So rather than trying to bend steel, we would work from beginning, like design with lines, that's how we typically work, um, and then try and figure out the the sort of the ruled surface that a board of timber would naturally form um, if you tried to bend it into that particular line. Come up with a simple way of joining the boards together. Come up with a very complex way of creating the, um, the formwork, which we would set out using a hologram. Um, so it's not so difficult to set out arbitrary formwork when you can see exactly where all these little bars would have to go as a, on the HoloLens. Uh, did a couple of prototypes of the idea, um, seemed to work pretty well, at least with thin material. And so then jumped into just an extremely complex formal proposal. So you'd build something out of these curved or steam bent timber strips, uh, make a bunch of chunks, join the chunks together, uh, clad it with some offcuts, and you end up with the proposal for the, for the Biennale. Um, so this was, I mentioned before, it's a collaboration, so with um, Igor Pantic and Sumin Harm from the Bartlett, and then also um, uh, myself and Cam Newnham from Melbourne. And so there's lots and lots of back and forth with this project all the time. And after we um, were lucky enough to get to build it, I mean, we decided, okay, well, we're not going to, we're not going to sort of tweak the design. There's no point. Um, uh, we we just we didn't have much confidence that we could change the design, still deliver on the design, and make it any more buildable. So just like with every other project I've shown in the talk, we've sort of started incrementally extending what we think is possible to build. So we started off with the with the proposal, and we'd done that tiny little prototype on the column, and after we we won it, um, well, we just started doing what we did in the proposal. So we went and bought a bunch of scaffolding, um, set it up in our studio, put a, steamed a bit of timber, you know, built a, t a steam box, whacked it on the scaffolding, digitized the piece of timber when it was on the scaffolding and off the scaffolding, 
and um, immediately ran into a brick wall of problems. So the, the first problem is that when you steam bend timber, you get a lot of spring back. Um, and we knew that we'd get spring back, but we didn't know how much. And what you see here is the black model is the, or the black lines are the piece of timber on the formwork, and then the red lines are the piece of timber once you take it off the formwork. So you get a lot of spring back, and the spring back's non-linear, so it depends on how much you bend the piece of timber. Um, that affects how much spring back you get. So we spent a bit of time effectively trying to model this, so um, in order to overbend the piece of timber. So we know what we wanted the end result to be, and then rather than having a, a bit of formwork which would just describe that end result, it would be slightly more bent than the end result, so the timber would pop back into the ideal shape. And then we came up with a couple of other clever ideas where um, we would create kind of composite parts. So you'd try and make a truss from two pieces of timber at once, um, which would also further minimise spring back. And we got to this point and we thought, oh, well, let's just build, uh, you know, a tenth of the pavilion and see what happens. Um, so we went to America, where there were some people who were crazy enough to want to try and build it with us. Uh, got a bunch of timber set out. We'd At this point, we'd well and truly ditched the scaffolding idea and rationalised everything into basically parts that could be fabricated on formwork, which was at most this high. Um, so this is what you see here, all of these little timber stands. We had some people from the art school at Temple University who'd done a bit of steam bending before help us out with um, you know, developing workflows and it's bending timber is nothing like bending steel. With steel, <laughs> steel you're sort of forcing it, um, whereas with timber you're massaging it all the time, you're massaging it over the mould. Um, and you can see it's kind of chaos, you know, you have lots and lots of little ants swarming all over the structure, trying to get it onto the formwork as quickly as you possibly can before it dries. And we did, the first test that we did was, we were sort of really happy with it. Um, so you can see here it's a, uh, the, or maybe you can just see, there's a kind of bright orange hologram of the piece of timber. And then, for the most part, the actual physical timber is hidden behind that hologram. It's bent into exactly the same shape. And to fabricate, and this was sort of the most complex piece, or the, the most extreme bend in the whole structure. So we thought, okay, if we can make this one, we can make all of them, so we just kept going. Um, kept putting things together. Um, though we hit a few brick walls with this prototype, big time. I mean, um, one thing we didn't anticipate was the ends of the strips. So we were accounting for some spring back, but um, we didn't get the ends of the formwork Right, so we basically ended up with all of our boards weren't bent at the ends. And when they have to join end to end, like you see in the middle of this chunk here, rather than making nice continuous curves, they make a little bit of a curve and then a completely straight segment and then a little bit of a curve again, which meant this prototype didn't really work as well as we wanted to, but um, you know, it was a big thing and we built it in two days and now we know more. So we're doing sort of another one of these prototypes and then our plan is that um, I mean, I'm just going to become an Estonian for two months, I think, to, to build the, the, the prototype over summer. I mean, it's partly wanting to build it and partly wanting to just be here in summer rather than in Melbourne in winter. But um, I think it'll be super duper fun. What I'd love to do is to, for anybody that's interested in learning more about, um, you know, using augmented reality for design or construction, come and chat to me. We'd love your help on the project, any help you want to throw at us, um, we'd appreciate it. And we'll also be working with some shiny new tools, so it won't just be this HoloLens, we have some new ones which are pretty exciting as well. So um, I might pause for a second to give myself a chance to catch my breath and then I'll show you how that actually works and we can do a, a demo. So yeah, thank you very much. Some questions? Um, do you think your system is also scalable to, um, to a serious construction scale? Meaning that, um, I don't know, the, the driver of the crane who has to move the huge building block or the panel 
for example, in whatever scale, is, is able to have this accuracy in it, or is the distance where you, your distance from the object uh, really um, crucial in that terms? Um, so, good question. Um, the crane example, I mean, it works, the short answer is it works really, really well when you're working with something which is right in front of you. So, again, with the brick laying, it works fantastically well because if you're looking at a hologram that's about a half a metre away from you, you can by eye position that brick to within a millimetre of where it should go. Whereas if you extrapolate that, project that one millimetre error to 50 metres or 100 metres further away, it suddenly becomes a half metre or more, you know. So, it's, um, uh, so you, could, you could do it but I just don't think it would work. Like, it's, there are other systems that are better at, at working with, say, cranes on sites than somebody wearing a headset in a, in a little um, cockpit. Um, the more broad answer to the question, though, is, I guess, inferring from the question a little bit, which is, do we think, like, all construction sites will be working with augmented reality on all jobs soon? Definitely not. Um, I think what... The, what we found and what others have found as well is um, using the augmented reality, it works fantastically well for like, complex set-out tasks. So whenever you have to measure something many, many times, especially when you have to measure something and you don't have that many known reference points, so it becomes super tedious, um, then this just solves that problem for you. Um, and the, the exciting thing to us is with a lot of kind of interesting experimental design that introduces that problem a lot of the time. Um, so maybe we can enable some kind of more radical experimental design by solving that one little specific problem. Um, yeah, it's not like a golden bullet yet. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first one technical question. Uh, when using the usual full virtual reality, then there is there are these problems of having to do very high frame rates and being very precise and so on. Otherwise, people just start feeling not very good. Is it easier with the augmented reality? You don't have to spend too much time on it. Um, yeah, pretty technical question. Um, you don't tend to get sick with... with um uh, augmented reality as much, partly because you don't see that much virtual information. So uh, Microsoft have done some studies on this. If you have, I think it's more than 60% of your field of view, if that's virtual, then you start getting that sickness. Um, but you, this, you never have that, so mm. that's fine. Some It can make you feel a bit sick if you don't wear it correctly, and you basically have eye strain, which then makes you mm. sick. But the brick, for instance, the bricklayers never complained about that. They just wear it. Okay. And what about the work safety issues when you are in a dangerous production environment? Are there any additional problems when you see some virtual stuff flickering? <laughs> or... uh, that's a really good question. Um, we haven't put ourselves in that position too often yet. Um, I guess it's kind of everybody that's that in the projects we showed is participating basically at their own risk. Um, I think that's a serious, certainly a serious issue, especially when these are getting used on, on um, uh, you know, particular, particular production lines where there's a risk of occluding something in the physical environment that could harm you. Um, again, most of the projects we've been doing, that we use this sort of more for working with sort of fairly small scale parts. I think you could get in trouble if you started trying to assemble much larger parts. Um, so short answer is yes, people are thinking okay. about it. Yeah. And one more general question. You must mostly position this project as uh, helping the human labor to build uh, these things faster that the robots cannot yet produce well. But at the same time, these robotics people are quite certainly trying to uh, remove the problem of having to use human labor at all. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, is it like a arms race between you and the robotics people, or you find like a different niche, or, or you are just moving faster than they are coming from behind? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, I, don't, I definitely don't feel like we're competing with um, robots on anything. Um, 
I feel like, I mean, I showed that little clip of the robot we extruding expanding foam um, and didn't talk about it very much at all, but the intention behind that project was to try and explore a, um, a kind of a closed feedback loop where you would describe everything that, like, through a series of behaviours, how the robot should respond to the material while it's making something. And it didn't have a preconceived idea of what it was trying to make, it was just making. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I have a strong belief in the value of traditional craft skills, in the value of, of sort of learning through making, um, in collaborative approaches to making, all of these things which are just a long way off being automated. Um, I'm not so interested in like a robot being able to lay bricks more efficiently than a bricklayer can. I'm more interested in those use cases where there's a sensibility, say, that's required that is difficult to encode. So I guess I'm, I'm like a converted um, roboticist in a way. I spent a long tri time trying to teach robots to have that sensibility. And now it's more of a case of, well, actually, what is, what's sort of important about the things that we're designing? Um, you get a lot more time to think about that when the problem of construction becomes so straightforward and non-technical. Um, but longer term, I, I think it's like much longer term, once, once you start putting yourself in Kurt's fail land, um, then it's a really, really interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thank you, very exciting thing. So my question, imagine your students will, um, will, give you, will make you a present for you. They will build a sailing boat from timber, wooden, and would you agree to sail with this? <laughs> uh, if my students built it, no. <laughs> um, if professional boat building students built it, definitely. So I think there's um, something that I'm, I'm picking up on your question a little bit here, which is that we're not interested necessarily in making, like it's the Michelangelo example before, of taking complete lay people and just turning them into like um, non-thinking, uh, executives of a particular skill, let's say. I'm kind of more interested in how you take an expert boat builder and enable them to build something they couldn't build before. It's incrementally extending what they can do, extending what we can build. That's like much more exciting to me. So if they already had the base level of skill of boat building, and then I could give them this and say, show me the boat that you couldn't build before, that'd be really, really exciting. If I gave this to my architecture students and said, build me a boat, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> and we'd sail that around in a bathtub, but no, nowhere else. I think so. so. Uh, th thank you. <laughs> and I have a uh, question, if you can uh, just very briefly say about the uh, difference between um, this ge geometry and uh, the first example that you mentioned with bricks. What is like the difference? Because um, this is, uh, let's say, the structure uh, is uh, made of uh, stripes. And um, like, not maybe going too much into detail, but you, you, if you can shed some light on what's the, like, technical or structural difference between the, the bricks and those <clears throat> panels of, or stripes that we can hear in, uh, see in this geometry? Um, technical difference as in um, why, why is this more difficult to build than the, the bricks? Or? More like a, a design approach, let's say, because I'm very much interested in, in this um, kind of geometry. Well, it's um, more of a personal question, if, if you can. Okay. Um, well, I mean, so with the bricks, the, a brick is kind of a, a, um, a very consistent, repeatable element. So all of the bricks are exactly the same. The only um, parameter that you're working with when you're bricklaying really is where that brick is. That's the only parameter. With the timber, there's so many more parameters. So every piece of timber behaves slightly differently when you bend it. And then um, in this case, where, where some of these pieces of timber are really, really long, and so then you get gravity starting to affect them, you get elastic properties of the material starting to affect them, you have the joints starting to affect how they go together. And so the, from a design point of view for us, 
where we thought that we might be able to implement augmented reality, as well as just making like the problem of setting out the formwork more efficient, which is not so interesting if you're just making something faster that you could do already, as well as solving that problem, we thought maybe there would be this kind of discovery in we'd build some timber strips, we'd put them up, we'd see where they were bending differently to how we expected them to bend, and then we'd be able to implement a process which enabled us to change the design and change how we built subsequent st strips. So as we were fabricating the pavilion, the design would be subtly changing to accommodate those unexpected differences in how the timber was behaving. Um, that is still something that we're interested in exploring. Um, the, the challenge for us at the moment is how much you allow the design to change, like how much error is acceptable um, for that process to still produce something that you're happy with at the end of it. So at the moment, with the prototype that we did, because the ends of the strips were straight, it introduced huge amounts of error as soon as you put two strips together. Um, and so that, that's too much error. Um, we definitely wouldn't want to do that with, with the whole thing. But we've, I mean, rather than, the next time we prototype this thing, rather than building it in, in parts, so you take two strips, you join them together, then you take two pairs of strips, you join them together, and then you take those quads of strips, you join them together, sort of building up incrementally, which I think this structure doesn't lend itself to at all. Um, the current approach is building a very sparse version of this. So you build every tenth strip, it, it, it spans the whole structure, um, which essentially like distributes the error over the whole structure. And then you digitize that in the same way we digitize the bent steel structure. And then when you add the next set of strips, those strips fit within the error of the initial one. So we're quite excited about that. Um, who knows if it works? I mean, this is, it's all, um, uh, it's very much a, a kind of a, an exciting but um, terrifying research project at the moment. Yeah. If you can yell for everyone. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I didn't show, I mean, I haven't shown all the projects we've done. I've only shown like the big successful ones, um, <laughs> or relatively speaking. I mean, all of this works fairly new. Most of the things I showed are from the last six months. Um, uh, really recently, some clients of ours, Keogh University, were exploring exactly that idea at a conference called Cadria. Um, I assume they'll publish something on it shortly. So yeah, that, that having a digital model which um, just presents options and then the model, the digital model would constantly update during the fabrication based on the decisions that were made by the fabricators. Some kind of name for this model, the collaborative something? Collaborative something, yeah. I, um, uh, no, there's no, there's no clear name for it yet. How do you call it? Um, we've called it, um, uh, like, you know, ad hoc fabrication and things like that, um, because that, that's sort of a little bit of what it is. Um, or, um, yeah, yeah, that's about as close as we've got to it. Thanks. If there's no more questions, we can we try, we try this thing. Can't. Yeah, we'll see, if, we'll see if it actually works. <clears throat> Hopefully it does. Uh, so what you're looking at here, this is the stage two model, um, which maybe it's not the best idea to show people, but it's too late now. Um, the, this big blue button is our software. So to get the model onto the headset, you click on the big blue button, and that's so that bricklayers or first year students or really anybody can do it. Um, and then if we're lucky, all I have to do is look at my screen, and then I get to see um, whatever I see in Rhino also on the headset. So if I change something in Rhino, I see the change on the headset. Um, ditto if I do things like click on buttons, 
which I've set up on the headset. That'll change my model in Rhino. So first thing I'm going to do is just make this a little bit smaller. And then so that it's sort of more exciting for you guys, we can see what I'm looking at. And I promised I wouldn't leave the, the podium. So this is the thing. Um, it's, this is a, a one to five version of the model. Um, it's the back of the model, actually, this bit. I wonder if I can just... So if anybody wants to have a look, all you have to do is be brave enough to come down the front and, <laughs> and have a look. Or you can do that after, after the lecture is um, finished. Very brave. So, give it the black room. So you can try poking your head in it if you want to. It's riveting. So now that I have a, um, a assistant, what I might do is you can keep looking at that and um, we'll do some stuff in here. So, I mean, there's an obvious use case, which is just being able to see your model at scale and in context, that's pretty useful for design. Um, and there's a couple of other really simple things that we can do which are kind of fun as well. So one of those is just being able to see the 3D scan of the lecture theatre, or at least whatever the, um, the HoloLens is currently picked up of that scan. So now we should be able to see a there's sort of a black room in here, so that the Hollands has hardly seen anything. This was the issue we were saying before. So the way that it figures out where it is in space is it's got four cameras. It compares the way those the pixels of those four cameras is changing um, and triangulates, basically, from, from the change in the pixels. But because they're just normal black and white cameras, if you're in a room which is, say, all black like this, it's really hard for it to pick out any pixels specifically which are changing. So it's funny, actually, because um, it works really, really well in like messy environments where things don't move. So say, workshops are like the perfect environment for a HoloLens, where you have lots and lots of tools on the wall and things like that. The other thing we can do, which is kind of fun, is see where this HoloLens is in the space. So. I'm just going to highlight it, and then. There it is there, the little green HoloLens. So as you walk around and have a look at the model. <laughs> yeah, you can put your head inside. It should work, I hope. <laughs> uh, you've disappeared inside the. <laughs> so, I mean, we this sort of. Lights on, is that going to help? Or if you could, we could, I mean, it's, already, it's much brighter now in here than it was before, so it seems to be working better than it was when it was completely dark. Sorry. Yep. In principle, it's possible to create dynamic objects. To create what? Uh, dynamic objects. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, all of the things I showed in the talk are mostly, generally speaking, dynamic. Um, for the demos, we just never, <laughs> never make anything dynamic. I mean, also yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff we can do, I and mean, you can connect your mobile phone to the same model, so you can be looking with your phone at the model as well as with the HoloLens headset. So you can clone yourself. And yeah, yeah, you could do that. That'd be pretty. <laughs> that'd be interesting. Um, uh, yes. Does anyone else want to have a try? Model, it's, um, wow. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, with this model, I mean, it'll look okay on the screen, so I can, I can um, fake it for everybody by making it much bigger. So in a second, that's going to go blow up. But yeah, you see, it's, it's a pretty small um, uh, viewing window. Yeah, there we go. It's one to one on there now. <laughs> I'll make it smaller again. Yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks very much. It does look very good on the HoloLens. It's um in September. <laughs> I mean, one, um, the, there's, there's a lot of things we're trying to figure out design-wise. So in this model, that you don't see any of those steel brackets. Um, and one of the things we're trying to figure out is how best to hide or express those steel brackets, or brass, we're hoping. you want precise registration of your um, digital model to physical space, which you never really care about with virtual reality. You're, with virtual reality, you're looking at creating virtual physical space, you know, that's yeah, yeah. as close to real as possible. Um, the other thing you're looking for with AR usually is some kind of effective shared experience, so you can have as many bricklayers as possible building, for instance. And it's the same with the Boeing engineers. One of the problems with their technique but they built a prototype um, of their AR system. But only one person could use it at, at a time, and they had to set up all sorts of sensors and things in the workspace so that nobody else could be in the workspace. So it was less efficient than having 10 people in there slowly making things. Um, and then the third big difference, I think, is between AR and VR is you can communicate with body language, and mm. I haven't shown it, but you can interact with things naturally. So. Yeah, for those reasons, I think they're always going to be quite different technologies. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um pretty small viewing window. And how can we apply it to Tokyo in July? Um that's an awesome question. Um <laughs> it's really simple. I'll give you my email address and then or even what would be really, really good is if you promise to email me. <laughs> um that'd be great. Uh, or you can give me your email address and then I'll get in touch with you. Yeah, I mean the the curvature is what makes it strong as well, actually. So you know, it's um, we're just, we're trying to figure out how to make the flat bits, not the curvy bits. I wonder how you fix it afterwards after the steam bending and it gets its position right, and then it's going to be in uh, extreme conditions with with a lot of sun and then a lot of wind and then a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the engineers are, are thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> they actually, they're um, 
the engineers are really, really good. I didn't mention them them before. Um, the their um, approach is, well, there's going to be a lot of redundancy in the structure. And so the idea is to just allow it to move. And so long as, um, so long as you're sort of anticipating that a little bit, then they can make it work. I'm pretty worried about it still. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks very much. You can take that. I mean, this, this is the sort of the stage two model, which is supposed to look good. Um, I think the other thing that's going to happen is, um, well, yeah, I mean, I really hope it doesn't happen, but the, the option is you just put some beefy steel structure in there. Um, I hope that doesn't happen. <coughs> Wait a minute. Wait, what? <laughs> Well, like that's like the last, you know, the, the worst case scenario is if the thing's going to move around too much, you've got to brace it somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so far, so good. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone.